Anything more? Thank you so much. Um, this is uh, really we're ju what we wanted to do with this a very uh, brief, in a way like a kind of a 30-minute, not exactly an intervention so much as a uh, uh, sharing of a complexification that's been important to us as we've been discussing this central notion of disenchantment that is part of our, uh, our kind of PCC project uh, and community's discourse. It's so central to it, <clears throat> disenchantment, re-enchantment, uh, etc. And um, the idea of, of misenchantment that, that uh, Matt will share with us. So um, the way we structured this is it's going to be very uh, concise and condensed. Uh, I'll do uh, eight minutes of setting out the history of disenchantment as a concept and as a reality. If there's a time, I'll, I'll, I'll stress my sense of why it's it's so crucial. Then we'll go to um, Matt, eight minutes on misenchantment and um, the, the complexification, then eight minutes of dialogue, and then some, some more time for discussion. Okay, we're off. Uh, so uh, disenchantment comes from, as, as we use it today, comes from Max Weber, the great German sociologist, and he basically um, ha had this, he's drawing on a, tr a term that comes from Schiller and what he's talking about is that with modernity the, uh, the modern worldview, our cosmology uh, understands the universe to have been essentially emptied of any intrinsic um, uh, spiritual or symbolic or expressive dimension that could, would provide a, a, a cosmic order within which human existence would be would find its ground of meaning and purpose uh, and instead the world is seen as uh, essentially um, it's seen in terms of neutral facts the detached rational understanding of which uh, will give the human being the power to explain, predict, and thereby control and manipulate that world. And uh, of course, the, it's important to recognize the uh, payoff that comes from that. And one of the payoffs that we tend to underestimate is the psychological and even in some sense spiritual emancipation that is part of the enlightenment um, euphoria uh, and it's it's Charles Taylor who especially uh, recognizes this he, he said one of the powerful attractions of this austere vision of disenchanting or what he also in in another place says uh, we could call it neutralizing the cosmos it's a very helpful term uh, here, again Taylor we could call this neutralizing the cosmos because the cosmos is no longer seen as the embodiment of a meaningful order which can define the good for us. We demystify the cosmos. There's another meaning of the term uh, disenchant. We can demystify it as a setter of ends or purposes. Instead, we grasp it me mechanistically and functionally as a domain <coughs> of possible means, okay, means to ends that we determine rather than a cosmos that has pre-given um, meanings and purposes that we align ourselves with. And Taylor points out that one of the powerful attractions of this vision long before it paid off in technology lies in the fact that a disenchanted world is correlative to a self-defining subject. In other words, you, you, you objectify the world, you empower the human subject because you are thereby able to win through to a self-defining identity uh, which was accompanied by a sense of exhilaration and power that the subject no longer needs to define his or her perfection or vice, his equilibrium or disharmony in relation to an external order. order. 
with the forging of this, this is still Charles Taylor, with the forging of this modern subjectivity, there comes a new notion of freedom and a newly central role attributed to freedom, which seems to have proven itself definitive and irreversible. Okay, so that's the psychological, in some sense, spiritual payoff. You, you disenchant the world and you, you then now have to find your meaning within and it creates a huge interior uh, growth because you're not getting all your uh, spiritual meanings from the relationship to a, an ensouled world. You're having to find it inside and as, as Jung says, because the stars have fallen from the heavens, we have psychology. Uh, we wouldn't have psychology without that uh, because the world would be seen symbolically. Now you have to find your symbolic um, significance from within. Um, it's of course uh, Nietzsche who recognizes pretty fully the, the existential consequences of this, uh, who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon uh, of meaning that has held our, our civilization. Are we not plunging continually? Is there still any up or down, et cetera, et cetera. Now why is this so important? Uh, besides the psycho-spiritual first in mm, euphoria and then deflation uh, and alienating uh, disorientation that Nietzsche is pointing to, there's also the reality that a cosmology is the container within which everything that happens in a civilization takes place. And so the cosmology defines in fundamental ways our, 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 it shapes our economics, it shapes our society, it shapes our, our psychology, our self-image, um, as these all in turn recursively shape the cosmology. So very, the, very briefly, the ways in which I see disenchantment as a f fundamentally crucial uh, concept to our um, kind of PCC um, aspiration to enter into a participatory relationship with, an ensou with the ensouled world uh, is and I'll, this will, I, I just wrote these out very quickly, so these will just be headlines. Um, first of all, it, it relates to the fundamental inflation of the, uh, in a pathological way of the part in relationship to the whole that the human being has um, uh, done in relationship to all the other species on the earth, that, which can all be objects, which we can now um, manipulate and control. Uh, there, second, there can be no genuine dialogue with a disenchanted world because it's all it. It's not a thou. Okay, it's an I-it relationship. And third, this empowers the uh, utilitarian mindset in such a way that it deforms and drains the culture's spiritual and moral imagination. It imprisons the cultural imagination in the literal. Um, the literal utilitarian explanatory rationalist neutralizing framework. Fourth, it legitimates a certain impulse to predatory dominance, uh, uh, which we have from inheritance from our primate aggression and, and so forth. It supercharges the will to power as it desensitizes our empathic sensitivity to the other in all other forms. Um, it empowers arrogance towards other cultures, other modes of knowing. It also increases our a tendency to um, treat other human beings as objects. And eventually, even ourselves, uh, even the discussion of ourselves as egos, as um, selfish genes, as meme machines, etc. That's the mechanistic reflection back on ourself, like the karmic uh, re boomerang. It channels numinosity and libido out into the uh, material consumerist uh, impulse and it exaggerates the greed and fear of the uh, atomistic individualism. 
it dissipates a sense, this is the second last one, it dissipates this, the, that potential for there to be a, a publicly affirmable cosmic um, encompassing matrix of meaning and purpose that can uh, give cohere a nourishing coherence to the, to the human community in, on Earth. And finally, and this is in some sense the coup de grace, by eliminating with disenchantment uh, the uh, ensouled universe, you eliminate a grounds for profound initiatory uh, death rebirth experiences that can that are essentially ultimately grounded in the archetypal forces of life and death that are embedded in nature and uh, uh, allow us to come into relationship to the cosmos in a, in a, in a totally new way. Um, and so uh, we're in a feedback loop of no initiatory rites of passage in our um, society and so people don't come into an en en enchanted relationship to the universe and in turn uh, that blocks out the possibility of even looking at having initiatory rites of passage that are that are that are uh, profound and viable and um, uh, would break that loop. No, that's. I also see all of that as serving a larger goal of telos. Uh, I think the entire thing I just described, I think, is also good in a certain way. It's serving a larger um, the potential for a larger good to unfold, but that's another story. But I would just first want to just hold the importance of disenchantment. Thanks, Rick. Um, you know, one of the main reasons I came to PCC was to participate in this. You know, I think of it as the reenchantment project. Uh, and in my attempt to kind of um, complexify the story a little bit, it's it's certainly I, I would affirm everything you just said. Um, and I'm glad you brought up Charles Taylor, a uh, famed Canadian philosopher. Um, I remember when uh, you came and saw my bookshelf for the first time, you were excited and, and humbled by the fact that, that passion was right next to Charles Taylor's um, A Secular Age and uh, Sources of the Self. And I think that's, that's deserved. Um, very important. You're both very important thinkers right now uh, in our moment. and. Um, another thinker that I want to bring to the table here is uh, the French, uh, really he's, he's a sociologist of science and anthropologist, but increasingly uh, he's becoming a philosopher and getting involved in the sort of speculative cosmological work that we do here. Uh, his name's Bruno Latour. I mentioned him in my earlier talk. And I wanted to bring him into this conversation about um, disenchantment uh, and re-enchantment. Coined this term misenchantment um, in order to point out the various ways in which um, the modern self has, in some ways, uh, not had the best understanding of, of how this historical process has unfolded. Uh, Latour wrote a book that was called We Have Never Been Modern. And in that book, what he's trying to do is take all of the tools of anthropology that initially. Uh, you know, sort of after the Enlightenment, the Western European world would send out its anthropologists to the, all these exotic foreign cultures and uh, try to explain their superstitions and their cultures by reference to our understanding of what it is to be rational and how the real natural world works and so on. Um, Latour is trying to use some of those tools but turn them back on the West, back on the modern European uh, modern European societies, um, modern European culture, and he's doing that in an attempt to establish some kind of symmetry between our culture and other cultures. Uh, and from his perspective, modern people kind of flatter themselves by uh, assuming that they are different, fundamentally different in kind than every other people to have existed on this planet or to who exist outside of Europe and, and America and North America today. Um, and this is true of whether you're a supporter of the Enlightenment or a member of the romantic reaction to the Enlightenment. Both of those poles carry that sense of the unique, special difference that the modern world represents. And for the Enlightenment, 
side, you know, there's a championing of it for the romantic reaction. There's the sense that this was a tragedy, um, but still uh, both assume that we actually did achieve autonomy, rationality, pure scientific knowledge of nature, and that, you know, what Latour wants to do is question uh, those ideas, that we actually did become rational, that we actually did remove ourselves from nature, that we actually did overcome myth. Uh, and, you know, the way that he uh, does this is, you know, he, he does a sort of, so just like he turns anthropology on modern culture as a whole, um, he also takes sociology and looks at how science is constructed in the laboratory and how um, what we think of as uh, reductionism um, that is supposedly explaining nature to us and giving us control over nature is in fact, uh, if you take any case example, it's, it's multiplying the number of agencies that are at work in the microscopic world uh, or in the macroscopic world and complexifying nature more than we ever would have thought it was. We thought it was a machine and it turns out, you know, uh, contemporary science doesn't really hold that perspective anymore. Popularizers of science do. Um, and Latour will point to the ecological crisis as an example of how, um, you know, if there ever was a test of the capacity of technology to control nature and to and of science to explain nature, um, it would seem that we have the science and technology have failed that test because the ecological crisis is now, uh, you know, so far out of our control um, that uh, you know, and and that the biosphere is so much more interconnected than any mechanistic picture, disenchanted picture would have supposed it was, um, that now, you know, as Latour puts it, um, he, he talks about this strange reversal that's taken place where in the past we assumed that nature, non-human nature, was devoid of agency, devoid of value and purpose, uh, and that only human beings had value, purpose, etc. And he talks about this in terms of the bifurcation of nature, which is a concept of Alfred North Whitehead's, where nature gets bifurcated into the subjective, qualitative uh, dimensions that we normally associate with humans, and then the quantitative, objectifiable, mechanistic uh, side of nature, or primary and secondary qualities, right? And so Latour says, the bifurcation of nature, so criticized by Whitehead, has not come to a close. It has reversed itself in the most unexpected way. The primary qualities being now marked by sensitivity, agency, reaction, uncertainty. The secondary qualities, all those subjective qualities, by indifference, insensibility, and numbness. So in other words, nature, uh, which Latour would want to call Gaia now, uh, is, is proving itself to be um, way more responsive and, and be a, uh, to be an active presence in, in the further unfolding of history, and human beings seeing you know climate change, mass extinction, and everything. While there are many organizations uh, and and you know PCC, uh, other groups uh, like ourselves that are um, aware of this crisis and trying to take the steps to change it at a political level, at a corporate business level, all of the momentum. One more minute. All the momentum uh, is is just to continue business as usual, and it's as if human beings in the modern West that we assumed were, all, were free and rational and have, have all the agency, now we seem insensitive, insensitive, numb, stupid, unable to respond to the, the changing biosphere, right? Um, so one more component I want to add just quickly is, you know, Charles Taylor talks about uh, the buffered self uh, and the way that the modern Western human being has gain this sense of autonomy, and to some extent that is true, but on the other hand, um, I, I would say that never before have we been so, has the self been so porous and threatened by, um, by being captured by the magic of, of, um, of consumerist capitalism, advertisement, uh, um, uh, fetish, uh, the fetishes of technology and of money, where we think that money has power, a sort of magical power, uh, when in fact money is just a symbol that helps us express our desires and make claims on other people's labor and you know it's it's the human relationships that have the power it's not the money and I think 
uh, we've been misenchanted by these things, you know, by gadgets and by money, uh, by advertisements, by celebrities. And it really complexifies the re-enchantment project because it's as if we are uh, sorcerers uh, waging a, a, a magical battle with, with dark magicians um, because they really do have that uh, enchanting power to uh, distract and divert people's attention from what they should be worrying about, which is reestablishing a, a sense of meaningful connection to the wider cosmos. Um, so it, it makes our task a little more difficult, actually, you know, because it's not just about reestablishing enchantment. It's, ba it's, it's sort of battling against a misenchantment. Right. Yeah. Um, so my time, my eight minutes are up, and I think now we can hopefully have a dialogue about this. Um, so the, uh, the redirecting of the... Um, Hmm, let's call it the. See, the word enchantment is it, it has the potential for we can see of being uh, ref, as referring to projection of what of of meaning onto something uh, out there. Uh, in that case, that's so uh, in be, becoming disenchanted of let's say fetishized uh, money and technology would be a from this point of view, a, an important project to, to decathect in psychological terms from, in order to be able to be open to um, authentic uh, participatory enchantment in, a, um, in, in, in an ensouled I thou dialogical universe. And um, I think m disenchantment makes misenchantment uh, not only possible but likely because we are psychological spiritual beings who need to have meaning and purpose and it's going to leak out into something else if it doesn't get uh, if it's if it's not um, nourished by our relationship to the heavens and the ocean and the grass and the um, butterflies so um, that's that. That's one thing about how disenchantment goes right into, you know, almost misenchantment is almost a automatic right. res result of it. Yeah. This this other um, with Latour, I have a feeling with Latour as I read him that I mean he's certainly making many um, uh, uh, imp important points that are my, my which I would be very much in agreement with. My sense is that he's slightly. Un, in in getting into his rhetoric of anti-modern versus romantics versus the modern, he he's slightly caricaturizing the uh, caricaturing the romantics and underestimating how much ro many romantics would be quite alert to the possibility that um, the mechanistic scientific um, perspective did not. Um, Things did not act, succeed in its project, mm -hmm. and uh, they've been saying this in a sense all along that that it's not grasping and and that there could be a return of the repressed in some sense, or which is kind of what we're looking at, and um, and I think Taylor's, I think Taylor is trying to show that the modern self has built up a capacity for autonomous self-reflection and uh, many other qualities, which I won't go into, that we now are using in this discussion right now or, and being able in this postmodern way to reflect on the entire modern project and assess it from multiple perspectives. That's a very postmodern um, possibility. And all of that was possible because the modern project got us that far to be able to have that level of reflexivity. So I, I guess I'm, wa I'm wanting to uh, um, preserve a, a greater sense of the nobility of uh, both the Enlightenment project and the Romantic uh, project and, and not caricature them as being just misguided. Yeah. I think um, in that earlier book, um, We Have Never Been Modern, which coincidentally was published in 1991, the same year as Passion, 
um, Latour kind of overstep, overstated his case a little bit, and he's recently published a second book where instead of being so hostile to the, the Romantics and the Enlightenment and the modern project, he's now realizing that um, he need that there are values within um, modernity that go into making up modernity that are political values, uh, legal system, science, modern religion, um, psychology, uh, that these different values, fears, art, um, they're worth defending. But what he wants to try to do is, uh, he thinks that moderns, um, they theorize poorly about their own practices. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they theorize about themselves in such a way that they would be radically different from all other peoples. Uh, whereas Latour wants to show how there is a symmetry that remains here. And if, if we can come up with better theories to explain our values, we could then have a more coherent worldview and a less bifurcated understanding of how human beings relate to the rest of the world and to non-modern peoples. Yeah, I think, and, that's, and, and he's drawing on the, on the anthropology uh, insight basically uh, mm -hmm. to do that and sociology which Bella does in in his book and uh, and in a sense psychology depth psychology also helps dissolve that rigid barrier between modern and the rest of right I have one question for you and then uh, and then maybe we will open up um, it seems that you're uh, that uh, that Latour who you're drawing on here it wants to, at least maybe in the earlier book, maybe not so much now, but it seems like he wants to uh, lessen the, like he says at one point, you know, the crisis is just, is, everyone's bemoaning the crisis different, in different ways, um, but it's just a kind of self, it's an illusion, the crisis. and. It seems to me, and maybe it wasn't as apparent to him in that earlier book with, where you gave me those pages, uh, the, the extent to which the, the disenchantment project has indeed created a biological, not just an existential crisis, but a, a, a biological, eco-geological crisis that, um, you know, where we're, we're basically crashing the Cenozoic. Uh, mm -hmm. And so in, in that sense, um, we can say without any um, inflated narcissistic sense of our own uniqueness that in some sense contemporary civilization has embarked on over these last 200 years and particularly in this last century uh, an unprecedented um, uh, project and modus operandi that is having unprecedented consequences mm -hmm. in, in terms of the homo sapiens experience. Right. And so, uh, right. so in that sense, I think disenchantment is very, uh, very, has very real efficacious. Certainly, um, yeah. I mean, he would just want to talk about it as a difference in scale rather than a difference in kind. That the modern West is not the first, that we're not the first people to discover something called rationality. For that, sure. that somehow distinguishes us from everyone else, but rather we're, we discovered um, certain values that led to certain developments that, are, that have um, spread across the planet, planetized the world, and that it's, it's really a matter of difference in scale versus yeah. difference in kind. Okay, um, in that sense, it would be just like what we're doing in terms of recognizing that all the things that Homo sapiens has that makes it unique right are actually shared mm -hmm. just difference in, in scale rather than in kind right. with other you know, primates, right. other m mammalian. Right. And, and, and I'll just yeah. add quickly and we'll open it up that um, Latour in 1991, I don't think he had any sense of the ecological crisis really. Uh -huh. um, he was more focused on social political Got it. crises. That would, that would explain um, the rhetoric, yeah. And you know, certainly there were plenty of people that were aware at that point he was a little late to get on that boat, but now he just gave the Gifford lectures um, about six months ago, uh, which are the same lectures that Whitehead gave that became Process and Reality. And he was, all of his lectures were about Gaia. Uh, Gaia not just as a scientific theory, but as a, a new mythos around which to organize our civilization. And for him, we're at this crossroads where we can either continue to modernize or we can ecologize. And, um, you know, 
for him, ecologizing uh, means re-enchanting the cosmos, I think. Um, and he's looking for a kind of imminent religion. It's, from his perspective, we, we've never really secularized. We've just diverted right. our sense of the sacred to money and technology. Uh, and he, he, we need a, a new kind of a theology, ultimately, to organize our civilization around. And he thinks that Gaia, um, you know, provides us with that sacred ground upon which to organize a new civilization. That's, that, that's great. So it sounds like he's gone through a real paradigm shift. I think in addition to technology and, and uh, money, we could also say celebrity has also been tremendously... I, I mean, when you think, look at what many Americans spend an enormous amount of their psychic energy, it's invested in celebrity and, and what they're watching on TV. What's that? Football. Yeah. The, what, you know, know sports. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Let's open it up. Jessica. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious about uh, what enchantment might look like, like some signifiers of it in a moment-to-moment -moment experience of reality. Uh, intrapsychically, interpersonally, and collectively, um, how do we know that we're living in, a, in an enchanted cosmos, or have some sense of what I'm asking right now, and answer it, please. Do you want to take a go at it? <laughs> well, if I think about what, you know, to use a specific example, I, you know, I'm trying to get as concrete as I can, um, thinking about the way Latour would, would talk about science. An enchanted science would be one that doesn't just assume that the human scientist uh, is in control of the experimental condition and um, that uh, all of the intelligence is, is, is just in, in them as the human, but rather when you're, say, um, trying to understand how a, a case that Latour studies is trying to understand how wine fer ferments. Um, there's th this, the scientist, in order to explain that process, has to establish an alliance with other beings. Uh, you know, the yeast that and, and the bacteria that is is involved in this process of fermenting alcohol. Uh, and before the scientist got into the laboratory to uncover the magic that was going on at the microscopic level. Um, they never would have expected all these these living agencies to be present in that process. So an enchanted science would be one which recognized the need to build alliances with other beings, other non-human beings, uh, in order to co-create knowledge. And it wouldn't be a knowledge that was based on just the imposition of technological control. It would be a knowledge that was based on a kind of diplomacy, a kind of... Um, alliance building so that you recognize that if you don't treat these bacteria well they're not going to ferment your wine for you you know so it's i think of enchantment as a way of acknowledging the agency of the non-human world and working with it to bring forth what would be beneficial to both parties yeah an example a perfect example of that is george washington carver Yes. You know, yeah. and, we, and Charlene's talked about um, Barbara McClintock. Yeah. The, the feel for the organism. You know, this is that, right. Yeah. The book about her. But I was amazed when I, you know, I just, you know, I grew up hearing George Washington Carver, but I researched him a little bit for my dissertation, and it's stunning. And and one thinker called it scientific spiritualism, you know, or something like that. his approach was really a merging of the scientific and the kind of and kind of an African indigenous type of approach, and mm -hmm. you know, he. Sorry, I don't want to take up too much time, but it's so fascinating. He told all these farmers to plant peanuts because there was a boll weevil infestation with their cotton. Mm -hmm. And it worked really good and it was brilliant, you know, but then there was an oversupply of peanuts and they were all thanked him and said, oh, this is great. And, but then there was too many peanuts and, and, and the <laughs> prices collapsed. And, and they were cursing him and, you know, calling him racial epithets, you know, just weeks later. And he was just devastated and felt immensely responsible for the livelihoods of all these farmers. So he locked himself in, the, in his lab for two weeks. And he asked Creator to, you know, 
Yes. Well, it, 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 I, you know, he basically wants to know all the secrets of the universe, and the creator said, that's way too much for your little mind to handle. And he said, well, tell me about the peanut. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, his, 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 his colleagues were stunned two weeks later when they came out of the laboratory, ended up <laughs> creating 300 products with the, the, the sweet potato and the peanut and the blah, 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 blah. All you need is peanut butter and you got a, a winner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's basically, I mean, certainly Rudolf Steiner's uh, biodyna biodynamic um, farm, agriculture, farming, and relationship to nature would be an example also of, of, of that. Uh, other things I think of. Um, Seeing, uh, seeing our works of art or our own experience, seeing the gods at work and, and, and experiencing the, the archetypal um, powers uh, in, their, in their magnificent sort of aesthetic you know, patterning and numinosity and coming through and day to day. I mean, it's like li living, whether it's looking at the uh, world news or in our own uh, ex private experience. Um, that's that's another way the kind of archetypal astrological uh, recognition of the uh, that deeper dimension. Mm -hmm. Think of also how we feel when we when we listen to music that transports us, or when when we're in love and suddenly we hear, um, you know, there were birds in the trees, but I never heard them singing, you know, till there was you. Uh, that. That's the enchanted moment. Suddenly, the universe opens up. What right. you know? What what happened to me? I was looking out, and now I'm feeling free. You know, it's a, it's, <laughs> it's that. Yeah. So those are enchanted. Just instead of assuming that the human being is the only creature capable of articulating itself meaningfully, we could look around to the rest of the cosmos and see signs and symbols happening all the time, and and recognize that really, if anyone, it, the, the universe taught human beings how to speak. You know, Steiner actually says he has this great lecture about how the motions of the planets through the fixed constellations was the, was the basis for the alphabet, where the, the moving planets were the vowels, the fixed constellations were the consonants, and that the this song of the spheres was they it sung the spheres the heavens sung the alphabet to early hmm. Homo sapiens, and that's how we learned to speak. Uh, I think almost every presentation that happens here in our Esalen week uh, is a reflection on what you've asked. I mean, I think about um, the what the one on on Elizabeth on water, um, or uh, it, and each each thing that somebody's doing here is 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 showing us that deeper way of relating to, to the world. I think, I th I, uh, do, who's going to call? <laughs> yeah, we're not in a rush. Why don't we go, Sean, Sean's very shyly, and uh, Aaron, and Erica, and Laura. Um, I'm sure you've thought of it, but I'm wondering what your thoughts have been. Um, the relationship of uh, your, your insights around misenchantment and Barfield's concept of idolatry, which seems to be very similar. Mm -hmm. Paul Tillich, the theologian, also spoke about idolatry in that sense. So recognizing that uh, secularization <laughs> is real, it, it, of course, it can't really get rid of the sacred. It just dissociates our relationship to it, and we have ersatz religion or ersatz substitute, substitute religion, substitute satisfaction, mm -hmm. idolatry being one. So, so there's a history of this uh, yeah. concept, is I guess what I'm pointing to, and have you been inspired by the history in your thinking around the idea of the message? Yeah. Um, yeah, these aren't new, these aren't new ideas, I think. Um, the notion of idolatry goes back to ancient Hebrew religion, and um, the notion of a fetish is, is Marx, also Jewish. Um, Barfield certainly has, has brought that into conversation with a sort of evolutionary spirituality, uh, whereas, as you were expressing, Rick, there's, this is a necessary moment, this enchantment is a necessary moment in the um, dialectic of history so that we can 
Potentially. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that, that there is a lesson to be learned here um, and that uh, without this disenchantment, without uh, this, um, this sort of detour into a kind of ersatz uh, religion that we wouldn't be able to intentionally rediscover what for our ancestors came naturally in, in, it's almost almost intrinsically and you know Barfield talks about this as original versus final participation um, and yeah certainly I've this didn't all just come from Latour um, you know and I, I in terms of this notion of idolatry in the, the, the Jewish tradition uh, maybe someone will remind me who it was I heard this from, but they thought of uh, Freud as um, actually a very spiritual thinker in the Jewish tradition. David, David Bakan, the, uh, Freud in the Jewish mystical tradition. Okay, that's the source to turn to. But just the idea that while Freud can seem like uh, very disenchanted and, and um, kind of... Uh, against any sort of mystical feel or just wanting to reduce mysticism what he was really trying to point to is the fact that the that the divine is impossible to express and and to uh to give any sort of um you know it's ineffable you can't actually put any words on it that could capture it so i mean i don't necessarily agree with him entirely but i think he was trying to point to this like transcendent uh uh divinity that you know nowadays maybe we need something a little more earth-based to balance it but um, I think someone like Freud being in that that Jewish tradition and talking about idolatry uh, recognized that any sort of concrete image that you might want to give for the divine is going to be is going to fall short in some way and that he may have been trying to hold out for this 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 deeper mystery I'd, I'd say he um he was the Moses of the modern soul in certain ways, and he uh, he um, created a new mythology, as Wittgenstein said about him. Um, but he could only uh, fit it within the Enlightenment reductionist program that he was committed to. Uh, so, uh, but more um, depths were speaking through him. Than, than he recognized, I think. Hi. Um, well, thanks to you both for such an eloquent and sort of rousing conversation. I'm a little overwhelmed by this kind of wave of ideas here. I just wanted to kind of uh, uh, try to refine some, some terminology here in conversation with you. Um, when you bring up Weber, and the concept of, of disenchantment, I, I immediately think of Durkheim, who I know Weber had some, some issues with. D Durkheim felt that uh, in religion, society is kind of worshiping itself, um, and uh, uh, symbolic structures reflect uh, social structures. And I'm, I, I recognize that Weber is, in some sense, in a kind of rebellion against this sort of positive sociology. Um, but but I, I brought in Durkheim for, for a reason, um, which is to suggest that if we have this, this trio of the enchanted and then going to disenchanted and then now we're, we're reaching towards re-enchantment, it seems to me that the, the enchanted was already misenchanted because it enforced oppressive, it, it enforced and, and deified oppressive, let's say, social structures. Um, Depends what era you're talking about. It, it does, that's true. Um, but I, I want to talk about the era of enchantment that is uh, uh, just in the in the century, just in the few centuries leading up to this era of disenchantment that I think uh, Weber and, and both of you are referring to, or using that word to describe. Um, it, I think this this question of initiation we talked about this being an important element of, of the enchanted um, initiation. To me, I realize that there are kind of senses of initiation that pervade society, but it also suggests a certain elitism. I think folks who are going through really profound death, rebirth kinds of initiations is a pretty small number. It's a kind of elite. Um, and so, anyway, I think that has some relevance to this question of the positive sides of, of disenchantment. Um, Could I just say uh, to, to, that the it's, 
it's because in the evolution of societies, we had a, um, the, the, lo the um, identification of the sacred cosmology with a particular complex hierarchical civilization with the pharaoh or king as the mediator to the divine is uh, which got replicated in the medieval era um, is one of the greatest engines for uh, the power of the modern project that dis disenchanting the universe um, helped free us up from the the archaic uh, the oppressive aspects of the archaic heritage which in the meantime though had helped produce the the capacity for the modern mind it wouldn't have yes. modern mind wouldn't have come out of the primal mind it had to go through the centralization concentration elevation of a very powerful um, nexus of will and mind that uh, was that led to uh, the modern so right. but once you disenchant the world then hell isn't there anymore and and heaven's not there anymore and suddenly we can start living in this life without just thinking about the posthumous life as the only one that counts and God isn't watching over every single action you're about to take and if you have that bad thought eternity in hell etc there is huge psychological um, as well as political uh, motivations in cleaning the slate uh, as Descartes and Bacon yeah. did so I just wanted to kind of break, add yeah. that to, to what had been said, um, uh, not to try to argue against anything that had been said, but to kind of bring that in. Yeah, and so in it. light of that addition, I want to suggest that we're, that re-enchantment is perhaps a potentially misleading term here. Um, sure. Insofar as that connotes a kind of a, a, cons a bad style of conservatism that wants to, in the name of recovering meaning, to reinstate a kind of caste system okay so so the re and re-enchantment is potentially uh, problematic insofar as it's open to that kind of misinterpretation and so in as I was listening to you talk I came up I, I, just whatever I, I just had this idea that what we're trying to do is not re-enchant but to try to conjure um, a, a nourishing darkness. Um, Matt, you said you said you were we were trying to uh, we were engaged in a kind of battle of sorcery against the dark magicians. But in fact, I think now in the in this kind of postmodern context that we find ourselves in, we are in a sense the dark magicians. But I'm again I'm referring to a kind of nourishing dark, the darkness that allows all the stars to shine in the sky, mm -hmm. rather than the single domineering light of the sun that says this is light once and for all. This one source forever and ever, amen. Um, so rather than re-enchantment, let's talk about some conjuring. I like the kind of dark uh, uh, implications of this word conjuring. Hey, can't can't re-enchantment be one of those stars too? Yeah, fine. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm, again, I'm trying to add, not to, to just simply shut down. Okay. I'm trying to say let's 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 think about what the re and re-enchantment might refer to. Aaron, Aaron let's let uh, okay. some of the other folks uh, who might have thoughts too. Thank, but those were really great points. Yeah. They were. Uh, I think Erica. Yeah, I guess to follow that. You're the dark goddess. Um, George Washington Carver, uh, thinking of what his method was. Um, for extracting the knowledge of the peanut. Um, the direct quote of him is, anything will give up its secrets if you love it, peanut. And that's a very different <laughs> time to get that <laughs> um, than I see deployed so often on, on this planet. And um, I keep hearing this word project, like you know, the enchantment project, the enlightenment project, the re-enchantment, or maybe you know, what are we re, what's this re, what is the re-enchantment re project? But, what of a project in which um, the ego, the we ego, are you know sort of are not the primary architects, mm -hmm. um, such that um, Matt, you mentioned co that we need to learn to co-create knowledge with other living organisms again to, to come with that humility and that love um, for the other. But what about co-creating knowledge with the mystery, sort of the mystery of our existence? This. Um, how to ally with that architect, that which 
you know, mysteriously we're all here together somehow mm -hmm. um, in order to self-organize um, that mysterious property of organisms. And I'm thinking on a cultural, like a large scale, human scale, um, because you know, organisms defy entropy. It, it life is, it doesn't seem to be a machine that runs down. Um, and it's such a, a you know, my, I guess my question is in here is, is like how do we co-create knowledge with that mystery, but looking not just on an individual level, but sort of like culturally, it, it seems like we can't engineer our way and so no one's going to sit down, no corporation or think tank is going to sit down and be like, okay, this is how we're going to have a new social system. Um, it's such a conundrum for me, um, even as I like I, I've just come off a of vision quest and I and I got a vision and I can tell you it's not a rational fucking thing. Yeah. It's this weird dance and this strange language and song that I have to sing that somehow brings me into deep, profound belonging and participation. How how can that it just seems I feel kind of Saturn like kinda of coming in, going, All right, it's time to be born but what you know, there's a mystery there. Mm. Was there a question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How to, how to co-create with the mystery. I, th I think w one thought I have to listen to you talk is how important it is to recognize that we're already participating in, in, in the mystery uh, and um, each project that we are engaged in is in some sense we're vessels of, of um, Impulses and, and 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 forces and potentialities that uh, we're 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 porous, we're permeable, we're we're it. I believe the this cosmic mystery is in some sense depending on our individualities and our communities to um, to be courageous uh, and to um, use our disciplines and our, our wits and and uh, our capacity to see our shadow for example those are huge um, psychological and intellectual and volitional achievements or or, or tasks that uh, the mystery is I think in some sense uh, de depending on that those elements of the mystery that we are uh, so that's one way of looking at it. So it isn't uh, so much of a zero-sum game of like the ego doing the project uh, or the mystery doing the project, but in a sense we're already uh, enacting um, the the white and we're we're concressing the the the, the universal through us. Mm. You know, I thought of um, a book by a thinker named Ernest Becker called *The Denial of Death*, and when I, as soon as you talked about how to co-create with the mystery, the, the central mystery that I think of for we incarnated egoic beings is death. And uh, in, in his book, Becker talks about, I think it's him who talks about the Kazasoi project, the, mm -hmm. the, the, this idea that modernity's main project was to raise the egoic rational self to a status that it was its own cause with the ultimate goal of somehow transcending the body and transcending death. And that's not co-creating with the mystery, that's denying the mystery. Uh, and this denial of death, I think, has ramifications uh, in many different uh, areas of our civilization. I think, to a large extent, we go to war with others to try to gain control over death, because if we're killing them, somehow that gives us a sense of control over this mystery. Um, I th if you look at our healthcare system, why is it so totally. expensive? Yeah. Because we deny death and we keep people alive even when, you know, the soul is is not there anymore. Or the singularity project, the sort of yeah, Kurzweil, let's download our consciousness know, like onto computers. Desperate effort to yeah. So I think part of co-creating with that mystery is re-engaging with death, not as a negative thing that needs to be avoided, not as a disease that needs to be cured, but we we need to find ways of ritualizing that process of passing over. Uh, that are life affirming, not in the sense that you have to deny death, but in the sense that you uh, learn to cherish life because of that mystery, and because it 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 uh, you know it surrounds us. From, you know we're we're born out of mystery and we return to mystery, 
and think of it as an adventure rather than as just a, a tragic end. And I think initiation has a lot to do with this. Yeah. Experiencing death and rebirth while still in a body. Um, and we need to democratize initiation, initiation so that it's well, not for elites only. Which is what Steiner said Christianity was all about, was democratizing the ancient mysteries uh, uh, to participate in um, you know, what you're saying about death is, is, is all uh, so exactly uh, spot on. And it's probably, it's the one thing that the gods are jealous of mortals for, because that's the one thing that distinguishes us from the immortals is that we, we have death that makes everything profoundly more significant than if, like, I mean, this is the last time that I get to be with you. This is our last time with you in this form right now, so. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's our time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>